he said something very chilling to me, which was, I said, why do you think that Democrats really never mastered talk radio? And he said, oh, that's, he had an immediate answer for that, which is they master the cool mediums. They master TV. Um, we master the hot mediums like talk radio because I can with your mind if I'm just coming in between your ears. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest this week is Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Jennifer Sr. Last week, Jennifer published a profile of Steve Bannon in The Atlantic. In Jennifer's words, Bannon is, quote, attempting to insert a lit bomb into the mouth of American democracy. In many ways, Steve Bannon is the original internet troll, or at least certainly one of the most influential. He's talked to Jennifer and others about how, when he was running Breitbart, he intentionally built out the comment section in order to build a community of the outraged. As he's put it, quote, this could be weaponized at some point in time. The angry voices properly directed have latent political power. That's exactly what he did to help elect Donald Trump and fuel the January 6th insurrection. And it's exactly what he's still doing today. Which is why I wanted to talk to Jennifer, to understand Bannon's role and the internets in creating our current political crisis. Here's Jennifer Sr. Jennifer Sr., welcome to Offline. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, so I've always thought of, uh, of Steve Bannon as an internet troll who helped fuel an insurrection. So I figured your Atlant- <laughs> <laughs> I figured your Atlantic piece would be a great fit for this show, which is about how the internet is breaking our brains. Um, but I wanted to start with like why you wrote the piece in the first place, because you could make an argument, and I'm sure you've heard this argument, that Steve mm-hmm. Bannon seeks and receives more attention than he might actually deserve, uh, especially for someone whose standing in, in MAGA world isn't what it once was. Why do you think Bannon matters right now? Because I think he's the one who's stretching the discourse at at the sort of treacherous, perilous end. Um, That's one reason. I mean, more broadly, I had been only writing non-political stories for The Atlantic. And my editor finally said, "Okay, you know, democracy is um, sort of on the line and it's kind of a jump ball for the next God knows how long decade, rest of our known natural lives. Uh, Pick someone, anyone. And... I think the really profound questions are surrounding, you know, epistemological warfare. Mm -hmm. And he is sowing all of these crazy conspiracies, right? He's um, he's got a very energized base, um, not base, listenership. Uh, I think he is an asymmetrical threat. I think you, as we saw on January sixth, you don't need that many people to be really angry and to breach a barrier at a Capitol and to do serious damage. Um, And I think he really inflames his audience. And I think if you want to know where the discourse is kind of heading in, in crazy land and in, you know, disinformation land, I think Bannon is the place. I think you have to hear what he has to say. And by the way, I kind of hate that argument. I mean, the idea that like, I mean, exposure doesn't equal an endorsement. Right. I mean, it's journalism. And I think we're a little bit past that because we've learned what happens. I mean, people are going to do what they're going to do, whether we cover it or not. And I don't want to be caught on my back foot. I mean, there are things that he's saying right now that I think are important for us to listen to. Mm. Really important. And I don't think we want to be caught flat footed. I always wrestle with this. I mean, we, we, we wrestle with this on Pod Save America all the time, especially post Trump, because he's obsessed with you guys, by the way. Steve Bannon is. I didn't even know he knew us. <laughs> well, it, this is the way that I thought we flown under the radar. That's how I was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're just that little engine that could. You know? <laughs> it's really nice that you're succeeding. No, uh, it's, it's, I don't mean to cut you off. No, please. I now I, I, of course, want to hear this. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I, I, I figure, right. You know, um, I, I, it, this is the way that it comes up. Uh, he's very, he's fixated on the fact that, um, on Apple Podcasts, there's a politics category. Mm. And if you ever suggest to him that he dips below the number two, it makes him crazy. And you guys are almost always number one, and he's number two. So he's very aware of you because if he, if he's you know edged past you, something amazing has happened. What this sort of um, obscures is that you guys are – much better listened to by 10x or 100. I mean, there's a real difference in audience volume between you two. And the Apple 
politics category is not very precise in showing how many people listen to what. But anyway, he's hot. He has almost an ominous awareness of you guys. Fantastic. Love that. Yeah, um, sure. No, I figured that out because, you know, Tommy Vitor, my co-host, uh, who you know of, um, was uh, has started listening to Steve Bannon's podcast like a couple months ago. And I started listening to it a little bit just in preparation for this interview. And I realized, I'm like, why does he have three episodes per day? But I realized he does a three-hour show, and then he cuts it up into three one-hour episodes every day that go on Apple, which is probably one reason why the it juices the ranking a little bit. But that is so much podcasting. I can't believe he's doing three-hour shows. Well, what you really should be amazed at is that he does four-hour shows. He added a fourth. Oh, because he does the battleground <laughs> thing, right? He does like one that's yeah. focused on poli- yeah, on electoral yeah. politics. From 10 to 12, he does, what, like you say, it's a two-hour show. And then he does another one from uh, five to seven now. And it's a little bit like the podcast equivalent of Logoria. You know, he just, he can't stop podcasting. Yeah, he, he does, he he does seem to like the sound of his own voice. Um, well, I mean... Oh, yeah. What I was saying earlier is like we, we struggle with this once in a while, even when we talk about Trump on Pod Save America, and we get some people saying like, he's gone. He's off Twitter. Why are you still talking about him? And their argument is, you know, like you're giving him the attention that he wants and you're giving more attention to him and his ideas. Like, how, how did you think about that when you were covering Bannon? Did you wrestle with that at all? Or is your thought like this is no. this is important to talk about because it just is and if people read about it that's fine that's what you want <laughs> I, yeah i mean I, no I, again we can stick our fingers in our ears and cover our eyes but i i think that it's actually use it's, it's critical that we know what he's talking about i mean just as an example mm-hmm. you know it, he has been banging his spoon on his high chair for months about the this idea that biden should be impeached for the volume of um, undocumented immigrants who are coming over the southern border. They're now at record highs. He thinks that this is, you know, failure to protect and defend, blah, 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 blah. I think that's nuts. You fix this through policy. If, if you don't like if you don't like it, you don't think Biden's doing, you know, the, the job that you want, you, you boot him out. You do. You, he thinks this is an impeachable offense, which I think is a promiscuous use of impeachment, obviously. <laughs> and I thought this was bananas. I thought this was, com- was completely bonkers. Uh, maybe a month ago, but maybe less. There was a poll that just came out that media I picked up on. Seventy uh, percent of all Republicans now think that when the House flips in twenty twenty two, which we all assume it will, um, the first thing they should do is impeach Biden. Yeah, I mean th- these things gain traction. I'm, I I wouldn't have known this, and I think Democrats should know this. They're acting like oh what? I mean, you know, the, all the f- the fringe people. McCarthy is going to have to cater to them in order to keep his coalition together yeah and we you have to know what the fringe is saying they are actually stretching they are mainstreaming dangerous ideas um more than half the caucus right now thinks that like mayorkas is impeachable they just sent this letter saying laying the predicate for this i will say that i would have guessed that they would impeach biden from basically the day that biden took office (laughs) if republicans take the house but these but i mean look partly because they would get this pressure from their media ecosystem. And I do think within that media ecosystem, clearly Bannon is driving much of the message, particularly after reading your piece about this. Like, So I'm sure he gets a lot of requests for interviews like this. I know he probably loves the publicity, but why do you think he let you in and gave you so much access? I was interested in that. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 it is a bafflement to me. I don't know. He's, he's fundamentally a media guy. Hmm. You know, um, I think the people who spent time in his orbit were mainly men. Um, maybe he just thought, let's, let's mix it up a bit. You wrote that a lot of liberals um, who've met Bannon are disarmed by how charming he is. I yeah. would never have thought to put the word charming in the same sentence as Steve Bannon, but can you elaborate on that? What is, what's, yeah, the, you met what's him? the charm? I have not met him. I have not had the pleasure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's one of the reasons he's successful, actually. Mm. I mean, you've got to be charismatic and you've, you've got to have something. Um, I, charming. Because here's the weird thing. I'll tell you a story, okay? I mean, just it, he can code switch, right? I mean, mm. he knows how to speak the way you and I speak um, because he's part of the East Coast elite, whether he wants to admit it or not. He's a card-carrying member. I mean... He went to Harvard Business School. He went to the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. He was at Goldman. 
you know, he worked in Hong Kong, he worked in Hollywood. I mean, but it was, it's his Hollywood stuff that was interesting to me. He started going off on a mad tear at one point saying to me, you know, you realize that the people who despise illegal immigrants the most are legal immigrants. He wanted to, he was about to go off on a mad tear about this, mm. you know, his own filibuster, which he's always doing. And, um, and I said to him, Steve, you want to know what? I learned this as a, a kid watching a movie by the super lefty independent filmmaker, John Sayles. Mm -hmm. um, in Lone Star, he has this amazing scene that shows just this tension. And I started to describe this scene. And he cut me off and he said, oh, John Sayles, don't you love him? He is amazing. Made one, that coal mining movie. I absolutely love that movie starts going off rhapsodously about like, you know, rhapsodizing rapturously about Mate Wan. Um He's funny. He's sunny. Yeah. I can't tell you how many people I know who are like you and me, who have described the horror of meeting him, wanting to despise him and finding themselves incapable. And he cultivated relationships with all kinds of you know, with tons of my colleagues in the press corps. Yeah, right? I was going to say, I mean, it, it is clear that the the Bannon spin on things was very uh, well represented in the media oh, yeah. in those days oh, yeah. of the Trump campaign in the early days of the White House, for sure, even more than some yeah. of his colleagues in the in the Trump campaign in White House. Right. And by the way, I'm not saying I knew just what he was doing. And I think he knew what I was doing. It was like that scene in The Wire when Stringer Bell and um, what's his name, Avon Barksdale, they both know that the other knows and they're about to betray each other. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to betray Steve Ben. And I said to him, I walked through the front door and said, I think what you're doing is dangerous. Yeah. And he knew I was a columnist for a year at the Times. I, I, I wrote a million columns about this. Offline is brought to you by Blue Moon. Share any summer memories you've had where you enjoyed every second of the experience or any upcoming summer plans you have. I have noticed that the warmer it's gotten, the more I'm opting for a beer, especially when I'm grilling out or outside generally. Yeah, it's just a little refreshing, especially if it's a Blue Moon beer, Tommy. Like, I, you know, like mixed drinks, like wine, but, you know, it's beer's a little more. It's a little summer. It's a good summer barbecue. Uh, yeah, it's thirst quenching. Great with a barbecue. Great with a barbecue. Great and, with a barbecue. And thank you to all of you who uh, tweet pictures of your Blue Moons at me. That's what I'm, that's the right level. That's what we're looking for It's here. his passion, people. Summer's the most fun when you can savor every moment, so why spend it drinking a light beer you don't actually enjoy? Blue Moon Light Sky is a light beer with incredible flavor you can only expect from Blue Moon, and it's the perfect companion to those summer moments you want to make the most of. It's so good you'll want to savor every sip. Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat and Tropical Wheat are two refreshingly light citrusy wheat beers checking in at just 95 calories per 12 ounces. Both beers are bright and crisp with a twist of citrus. Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat is brewed with real tangerine peel, and Blue Moon Light Sky Tropical Wheat is brewed with pineapple and orange peel. Get Blue Moon Light Sky Citrus Wheat and Light Sky Tropical Wheat delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline to see your delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline. Blue Moon Light Sky, save for every sip. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Offline is brought to you by Base Paws. Base Paws is the number one cat DNA test. Number one. Number one. We're number one that helps cat parents learn more about their cat's breed yeah. and health. I love it. Using a world-class feline genomic database, Base Paws can trace your cat's breed. Type. Wow, we're going way Base back. Base Paws can trace your cat's breed type and origins. Their breed influences their personality traits and most importantly, hereditary genetic health conditions. It's peace of mind that comes from deep science and it can help your cat live a longer and better life. Yeah, I want to know if my cat's from ancient Egypt. I don't have a cat currently, but at some point If I, I get one, I'll want to know. Hannah really wants a cat. I'm really? I'm like holding her off. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you guys get a cat, you know where to go. You know to get base paws to make sure you know about all the genetic health conditions. Use, using base paws is as easy as one, two, three. Just register your kit, swab the inside of your cat's mouth for five to ten seconds. <laughs> that could end well. <laughs> Send your sample to Base Paws using the prepaid mailer. Your report will include your cat's breed, dental health score, vital information about their health, and much more. So don't wait. Get peace of mind about your cat's health by visiting BasePaws.com and ordering your cat DNA kit today. Mm -hmm. That's B-A-S-E, 
P A W S dot com and use the code offline thirty. You don't get even, you 30. don't know what you're looking at right now. You got you got a cat in front of you. You know what the f- it is. Literally no <laughs> clue. Could be from anywhere. Use the code offline thirty to get thirty dollars off your first order. This is a special offer only available to our listeners. So make sure to visit basepaws.com and get thirty dollars off by using the code offline thirty. Base Paws, better lives lived longer. Pod Save America is brought to you by Magic Spoon. We're all trying to eat better. You, yeah, we are. But a healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff, and it's amazing as a midnight snack right before bed. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Honey Nut flavor does have one gram of sugar, though. Just want to note that. Only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb. You can build your own box. The nine available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry muffin, cinnamon roll, and honey nut. You're getting a lot of flavors these days. I'm just all in on frosted, though. I know. Frosted is the best. I'm, frosted all, is the best. I'm all about peanut butter, and I do the midnight snack thing. I have a bowl of Magic Spoon instead of dessert so often. And honestly, jokes aside, microphones aren't here, I'll tell you. I think it's like part of how I lost a bunch of weight. I love it. Wow. It's wow. That's the, that's the God's honest truth. Delish. Go to magicspoon.com slash cricket to grab a custom bundle of cereal and be sure to use our promo code cricket at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon's so confident in their product, it's back with 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt free cereal at magicspoon.com slash cricket and use the code cricket to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. So the moment in your piece that I knew this would make a great offline conversation was the story Bannon tells. Uh, about his days working for the internet gaming entertain, uh, working for internet gaming entertainment, where he first learns about the size and intensity of the online gaming community. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, it was really arresting, and I can't take credit for it. He told this story to Errol Morris in American Dharma, by the way, and th- that was at a kind of the moment of peak deep platforming of Steve Bannon, mm-hmm. and so very few people saw that and they should see it. I mean, this is the argument again for, you know, actually paying attention. I will just say, by the way, people should see it. I watched it the other night, again, in in preparation for this. And I know there was a lot of controversy after it came out. I do not think it was a favorable depiction of Steve Bannon in any way. And I thought it was actually, people should watch it to know why to the extent he is successful he is successful with his message i think correct exactly and I, i'm hoping that my piece did some of the same i mean errol is you know wouldn't want to compare myself to him he's uniquely suited to that kind of project and what here is what happened um he he knew just where this conversation was going to go so he's, he teed it up he said tell me about your time at internet gaming entertainment steve and steve said sure and I almost felt like he'd told the story before because he told it perfectly and in perfect syntax, almost yeah. in perfect paragraphs. He said that when he was in a Hong Kong, that was when he, and so this is in the mid 2000s, let's say, starting in the early 2000s. He was surprised to discover how many people played these multiplayer um, online games. I guess they were the world of Warcrafts and all the others. And how intensely they played them how many hours they played them. And that people would miss work to play them and that they were very identified with their online avatars. And that was when he realized that people's online personas were more real to them than their regular, than their you know, in-person personas. And that, that they preferred their idealized selves. And that a lot of the people who were doing this were angry, isolated men, and uh, that if you could harness that energy that they had, um, it could be weaponized. That was his word. It could be properly channeled and weaponized politically. And the example he gave was Dave from Accounting. Dave from Accounting was a 250-pound man who one day drops dead. And in real life, Dave from accounting has barely gone to church, has a few friends. They have to rent a preacher who barely knows him, speaks 10 minutes. They drop him in an urn in a perpetual cemetery, and that's Dave. But if online Dave dies, 
online Dave is Ajax. And if Ajax dies, it's a huge deal. Thousands of people show up for Ajax's funeral. He's brought to the funeral pyre in caissons, in a caisson. Um, the rival tribe comes out to fight. Uh, men and women actually stay home from their day jobs to attend Ajax's funeral. And as I was watching this, I thought, oh my God, yeah. this is what happened on January 6th. This is exactly what happened on January 6th. People showed up as their avatars. They showed up in face paint and fur skirts with their own weird weapons. They missed a day of work. They stormed the Capitol and fought a rival army. They had, the, 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 they had no longer made the distinction between online life and real life. I thought that nothing I've read describes the, the temptations and the dangers of online life better than that analogy between Dave and, and Ajax that he was given. And, yep. and can you talk about how Bannon's Ajax theory informed his years at Breitbart? Yeah. So when he realized that people preferred their idealized online selves, that they were their more glorious selves, but also their id selves, mm. right? I mean, they were their angrier selves. Um, their unfiltered selves. One of the first things he did when he got, when he took over Breitbart was he took over the comment section and he built it out thinking, this is where people are going to be their true selves, where I can harness all this energy. And also critically, he knew it was going to be a source of community because this is all the bowling alone stuff that Robert Putnam wrote about in 2000. All of our civic ties have been on decline for 22 years. Yep. We're no longer affiliated with churches and political groups and neighborhood organizations and the Elk Club and the Rotary Club. You know, what do we have? And online groups take the place of that for a lot of people. Twitter takes the place for, you know, uh, that for a lot of people. You know, it's a community, you know, it's solidarity and trolldom. You link arms. Well, the, that was my first thought. It's like the Breitbart comment section became a large part of Twitter. Uh, and it was proto-Twitter. <laughs> right? Like that's, it was proto-Twitter. It was proto-Twitter. And a lot of these yeah. social media platforms became the comment sections come to life, but sort of sped up and in real time. And now people are interacting with one another. I mean, I have often right. wondered if... The internet and especially social media are what made the MAGA movement possible. You can be anonymous. You can spread lies. You can get affirmation from the online mob for stoking ang anger and outrage. And you can be cruel without ever really having to see the reactions on the faces of the people that you hurt. I've been whinging about this for years. I think that that's right. It, there might be a, a sort of left analog a little bit. Well, I think the important thing for everyone to realize is we don't, none of us are immune from these technologies and algorithms and what they could potentially do to us. We're not just because we might be right about politics <laughs> doesn't mean that like the same sort of dynamic that might radicalize someone um, can at least change us a little bit, if not radicalize us as much as that. It's all the difference between embodied communication and not embodied communication. I think if you're hiding behind an avatar, I mean, there's just something fundamentally different if you're looking at someone. Yeah. I mean, it, it just, it, or even hearing them between your ears. There's just, it, it's, it, it's unmediated in a way that's really disturbing. I mean, you mentioned the connection to January 6th, where this sort of online fantasy becomes offline reality. It does yeah. seem that what separates Bannon from the other MAGA media stars is that he is explicitly trying to organize his online audience. You mentioned that he says openly his show is not about entertainment um, and that, they, that people need to use their agency. Did you get the sense that this is effective, that this is working? Well, it, I know it's working from the point of view of primary candidates who are raising money. You know, they go on his show and then they get cash, right? Also, he's a big proponent of the precinct the uh, strategy, which I'm sure you've heard about, mm -hmm. right? Which is this idea that you take back, um, th that you take over like all the state kind of uh, organization, I'm sorry, the state political infrastructure from the ground up, the school boards, you the precincts, eventually you get to run elections that way, right? You get to oversee them. 
Um, and he's been, ProPublica did a really great piece about this showing just how many people had signed up to be precinct captains. Once Steve Bannon started uh, talking about this day in and day out on a show, something like 8,500 people signed up for this. And by the way, this is another reason we ought to be paying attention. While we're angrily tweeting or not paying attention, they're capturing, you know, they're infiltrating all of the state organizations and becoming poll inspectors. I don't like that. We, sh we should also be poll inspector, you know? Well, I mean, it's, um, it, it really hit me because in a way I was reading it and thought that it, it's a bit of a like bizarro crooked media, Pod Save America, what we're trying to do, because I think when we started our company, we thought, okay, even the progressive media that's out there, a lot of it is progressive opinion and there's not a, okay, now here's how to go take action component to what you hear from the news, even if it's progressive news. And I think uh, even on Fox, you know, you have Tucker and, and Ingram and all them like just spewing hatred and, and, and extremism every night, but there's not an explicit, okay, here's how to go get involved. Bannon seems to be taking it to that next step where he's saying, here's, it's not just punditry that I'm offering you. This is how you need to sign up and get, and get active. What does he have? He has testimonials, right? He has like moms who have suddenly become active, who come on his show and say, you want to know what, Steve? It was this easy. I did this. I did this. I did oh, wow. this. And you can too. And here's the phone number. Here's how you can follow me. Here's how, you know, there was one woman I spoke to who just went on his show twice and got 11, got something like 1100 emails, just asking her how like they could participate, you know, in her project. I mean, there are all kinds of, um, he never lets a guest leave without their saying, how can people follow you? How can they reach you? How can they get in touch with you? He's got activist guests mm. and, um, and also his kind of um, pep talk stuff, you know, use your agency, put your shoulder to the wheel. Here's the phone number to call. Here's Lisa Murkowski's Senate office phone number if you want, you know, and then blah, 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 right. It's stuff like that. I mean, he gives people actionable advice mm. and it sinks in after a while and it creates community. Right. Which again, goes back to the online aspect of all of this. Right. That... And even if it's small, yep. right. I mean, again, because how many people do you need to storm a Capitol? What, if anything, do you think Bannon understands about our online era that the Democratic Party and mainstream media might not? I don't know if it's that he understands it better. I think he is um, less afraid. He's more shameless about it. He understands its emotional potential, that it's a hot medium, as he said to me. He said something very chilling to me, which was, I said, why do you think that Democrats really never mastered talk radio. And he said, oh, that's, he had an immediate answer for that, which is they master the cool mediums. They master TV. Um, we master the hot mediums like talk radio, because I can fuck with your mind if I'm just coming in between your ears. And wow. I think Democrats understand that just as well, but they're disinclined to do that uh, in part because they're not as nihilistic. I mean, they believe in actual policy. I mean, all of us are still valiantly trying to solve things through our institutions because we believe in them. We're not trying to take a wrecking ball to them. So uh, if you're busy laying dynamite beneath the floorboards of democracy and blowing everything up, what do you care? You know, and, and so you'll, you'll talk however you want. Um, he's very good at identifying wedge issues. Democrats don't tend to do wedge issues. Again, because I think they're trying to run a functioning government and sort of by definition believe that you reach across the aisle to do that, yeah. or at least you work. Well, I do want to hit on that institution point uh, on the Democratic side, but also just for the media. Like as a, as a member of the media, I wonder how you think about, you know, Bannon has been very explicit that the enemy is, the enemy is not even the Democrats, it's the media. You know, that's like the main, that was the sort of the, tr the early Trump years. They always talked right. about that. The Trump Lugan press. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you, how does how do people in the press handle the fact that you've been targeted as the enemy, and yet if you enter the fray, it it, it doesn't work as well because you're trying to be the defender of your own institution, and that institution is has some measure of needs to have some measure of objectivity to it. Like you're you're sort of 
you're you're being attacked, but you can't really fight back. <laughs> Can you? I mean, who? I was writing the piece. He wasn't. Right. <laughs> That's true. I guess. I mean, you <laughs> you have the freedom now, as you now you're writing profiles here at the Atlantic, to be a little more. I don't want to say a little more opinionated. Yeah. I think there's a lot of sort a of a lot more opinionated. There's a lot of beat reporters. You know, Times, Post, other places that are like, well, how much can we really? What can we really do here? And that's a larger question. How you wind up covering an aborning autocracy, I don't know, right? Or a, yeah. a party that's, you know, whose sole project seems to be, at this point, it seems to be content free. It's about power. I can't tell yet what these guys are, what their real platform is. Um, I mean, in some ways I can. Um, but uh, in my case, I mean, I was able to say that he was a conspiracist and a megalomaniac and a, a, a peddler of industrial grade bullshit all before <laughs> paragraph four. <laughs> I mean, so. You know, like, <laughs> well, you also, I mean, and you mentioned. No that, problemo. You, know? <laughs> you, mentioned, so. you mentioned that great line um, that he's trying to insert a lit bomb into the mouth of American democracy. Yeah. Um, you quoted yeah. my old boss, Barack Obama, saying that. Bannon understands it's not necessary for people to believe disinformation to weaken democratic institutions. You just have to flood a country's public square with enough raw sewage, which was a nicer way of paraphrasing what Bannon said to Michael Lewis in 2018, which is his strategy is to just flood the zone with shit. Um, Correct. Why do you think that works, flooding the zone with shit? Oh, um, gosh. Part of it has to do with this new wild world. I mean, it, we're easily distractible. We're all, um, not all. Most people are chasing clicks. Even the highbrow places are chasing clicks. Um, so the sticky stuff, the hot stuff, the emotional stuff works, you know, um, and we're not in 24 hour news cycles anymore. We're not even in three hour news cycles. We're in, you know, micro cycles of like 15 seconds. Right. So, uh, and a lot of the shit is actually just emotional stuff, really. It's the wedge issue stuff and it's the heated stuff. Um, I think that's one of the reasons it works. And also Obama was good at figuring out how to capture several media cycles. Like he would speak to a niche press and he would speak to, you know, he was good at figuring out what to do as the, as the media was breaking off into its different silos, I don't think he was being cynical about it, but he was very tactical about speaking to different audiences when he realized that nobody was watching Cronkite, right? Um, so he was, he was, and, and I think he was uh, even better at that in his second term than his first. I agree. Um, I think that he's a very, a, a uniquely talented politician, though I often wonder if he was president today instead of Biden, would he still be able to? get his message through, um, or would we have to, would we be able to adapt to um, this media environment where, as you said, we have these micro cycles? I, look, and I think the the danger that autocracy presents to the United States is a uniquely American danger. Um, you know, Neil Postman talked about this in Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is like, it's, the, the threat is mixed up in sort of entertainment and distraction and the river of bullshit that we get all the time is, it's just distracting us from the main, from the, from the most important issues. Our attention spans, we can't even remember who the Twitter villain was yesterday <laughs> anymore, right? Because we're on to the next thing. Just and if we bet on a Kardashian. Right. And, yes. if we, and, and news about, you know, Vladimir Putin possibly using nuclear weapons is right next to, uh, you know, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, right? And, and, and then some silly thing that everyone thinks is funny, right? So... The, it's, it's really hard to sit for a while and, and grab people's attentions and hold that attention, which is what you need to organize and build institutions that people have faith in. And I think what Bannon and, and Trump and some of the people on the right understand is all they have to do is just knock it all down, right? They, and, and they are pushing on an open door because faith in our institutions has been declining now for decades decades. Right. And the Democratic Party is caught in the unenviable position of trying to be the defender of institutions. Institutionalists. When yes. Institutionalists <laughs> when people are upset with institutions. And so there is a, yeah. as, as much as 
a lot of smart strategists on our side will say, well, we got to have populism of our own and economic populism. And I happen to agree with a lot of economic populism. But there is a limit to our populism because at the end of the day, we are now the ones defending democracy. Democracy requires institutions and institutions not only require work, but they often lead to a lot of disappointment because they're not perfect. Right. The, the, one of the great ironies here is that we're the institutionalists. We're suddenly developed, defending the military and the FBI and the C, right? All the, you know, the deep state. Um, but also that we are suddenly the slow plotting incrementalists arguing for conservative, slow plotting change. Some, I mean, some of us, right? Whereas the Republicans in the main are now just advocating. For, I mean, they just want to blow it all up. Right. And it's content free. And and I, I, I asked Bannon more than any other question. I would come back to this almost every hour with kind of tedious metronomic regularity, I would say. And, and what's going to come up in its place mm. again when you're done? And he never had an answer for it. And there was one line that I had that I, I cut. We cut it. it. It was just my piece was getting really long. Um, but he said, look, you know, some people are here to clear the fields and other here to, you know, to settle. And I'm here to clear the field. And I thought that's such a quaint way of putting what you're doing, which he's not clearing any fields. I mean, there's no, there's, he, he is blunt. He is frank. There's no vision. There's he has no, no plan. And that's why I think it is, it, it I don't think it, there, it's a lot of genius to it <laughs> because it's very easy. Cynicism, yeah. It's it's very cynical, but it's 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 lazy and it's cynical, right? But it's like, right? Like you keep asking him that question. Well, what do you want to build? And once you once you blow everything up, what do you want to build in its place? He doesn't have an idea. Right. He doesn't have no. an idea because what they're thinking about right now is just how can we harness the disappointment and anger uh, and cynicism that is already out there that has been supercharged by an online media environment. How do we harness that? rage towards our institutions, towards government, towards media, towards business, towards whatever it may be, and just burn those institutions down. Because our answer to people being upset is, you're right, and here's the people that you should blame. Right, exactly. Um, I can't really put it better myself. I and mean, it's people, I think well, that that... I mean, you know, it's people who, it's people who don't look like you, it's people who don't come from where you come from. It's people with more power than you, with more status than you, with more wealth. So it goes both. It goes sort of both ways, right? There, I think there's been so much focus on, you know, with good reason, on the racism and the xenophobia, and that's a huge part of it. Though now that I've been listening to the war room, which I'm sure you have too, what what he's focuses on most is sort of elites and institutions, whether it's Democrats it, or Republicans. It's cultural. Right? It's yeah. cultural. I think, and that's what's most interesting to me. I mean, there really, there are very few policy prescriptions in there. Every once in a while, you'll get a breath of his Leninism, like, you know, nationalize the pharmaceutical companies. Sure. Great. <laughs> you know, like, right, yeah. bring it on. Yeah, right. You know? But like, I mean, I agree with that. You know, I, maybe once I heard him talk about raising corporate tax rates, but did I, or was he just talking to me? I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not sure, you know, if he's ever said that on the air. And, you know, certainly his time in the White House, he didn't say anything like that. Either. But I mean, I think um, what, um, what he mainly talks about, he's very, very um, fixated. I think that the educational attainment divide is, is something that he's really exploiting. Institu institution capture, the elites are trying to turn your kids um, woke and queer, and they're trying to operate on your children without your consent, and they're trying to read stuff to them without your consent. And th by the way, the, you know, Katanji Brown Jackson um, uh, uh, is, you know, is a pedophile by association, you know, is easy on pedophiles, is soft on pedophiles. One of the most fascinating conversations I had with him, because he was relentless about this on his show. He would not stop. And he kept saying, this isn't my line of country. I hate talking about this. He is always talking about this. He loves mentioning pedophilia. I mean, like, that's ridiculous. Of course. But so this was easy for him to talk about. Anyway, but he had like five days of talking about Katanji Brown Jackson, you know, these terrible departures from the sentencing guidelines and even from the other recommendations. So the one case that he was really hung up on was Hawkins, that 18-year-old kid 
who only got three months. Mm -hmm. And it's true, that was a radical decision compared to the others, right? It was, it was less than anybody had recommended. But the Washington Post found him and discovered there hadn't been any recidivism, right? He was closeted, gay, black, in a community that was not particularly forgiving of being um, gay. And also he was probably that weird combination, combination of both inured to and electrified by online porn and didn't quite know what he was doing um, or thought, this is sick, this is amazing. Let me, you know, I, yeah. I, who knows what he was thinking? He was 18, you know, and Bannon was ranting about this to me. And I was saying to him, that I had a very different point of view and it was the one I just gave you. And I then started giving him grief about Marjorie Taylor Greene and he said, you're just trying to change the subject because you're, you're losing this particular argument that we're having. And I said, I'm not losing this argument. It's just that we can't agree. Like we see this fundamentally differently. So he indulged me, we started talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene. And then five minutes later, he looked at me and he said, okay, wait, let me just see if I got this right. So what you're saying about the Hawkins case is that you just think here is a kid who is gay and black and this was all tied up in issues of masculinity in the African-American community and, and he spits it out completely compassionately, completely just as I had. He can do it. It's just that that's not great radio. It's not, that's not a wedge issue. Offline is brought to you by Public Goods, the one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality, everyday essentials made from clean ingredients at an affordable price. Everything from coffee to toilet paper and shampoo to pet food. Public Goods is your new everything store, thoughtfully designed for the conscious consumer. Rather than buying from a bunch of single product brands, Public Goods members can buy all their premium essentials in one place with one beautiful, streamlined aesthetic. Public Goods searches the globe to find clean, healthy, eco-friendly, and innovative products. I loaded up on public goods things. On poop bags? No, well, I have so many of those now. I bought like a dozen bars of soap. Oh, and then that's right. We got, soap, we got the big bar soap, soap guy over here. I love bar Loves soap. Loves the bar soap. Some innovation does need to happen. Keep your liquid soaps elsewhere. What's your favorite part about packaging. it? Packaging. Squeegeeing it off the fucking shower? Just getting it, just a little yeah, residue at least behind? Like, what, what's going on at your Freaks. house? Freaks. <laughs> what are you fucking shower? Freak. <laughs> anyway, public goods is a great company. <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah. their, I love their salad bowls. Too. Yeah, you have great, great bowls, great bowls. They ethically source and obsessively develop each of their products to be free of unhealthy ingredients and harmful additives still common on drug and grocery store shelves. They are committed to making their products healthy and safe for humans, animals, and the environment. They use a membership model to keep costs low and pass on even more savings to their customers. Best of all, you can make your first purchase with no obligation. Join hundreds of thousands of others who've switched to their new everything store. We've worked out an awesome deal. Receive $15 off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. That's right. They're so confident. You're going to absolutely love their products and come back again and again. They're giving you 15 bucks to spend on your first purchase. You got nothing to lose. And their prices are low to begin with. Yeah. So that if an extra $15, you're, 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 you're it's getting a steal. lot of stuff. Just go to publicgoods.com slash offline or use code offline at checkout. A lot of bars of soap. A lot of bars of soda, as many you can carry out of the store. P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash offline to receive $15 off your first order and your very first bar of soap. Offline is brought to you by Seeker. You rely on ratings to find good restaurants and hire talented local professionals because transparency and reliability help you make smart decisions. So why not trust similar ratings to assess the accuracy of the information you search online? Here is where we're supposed to insert the message I mean, of agreeance. They got a point, John. Just to help extend the metaphor, um, uh, I had to hire a plumber the other day. They did not fix the problem, so you they had to drain? hire another plumber. You right. So if you're dealing with a cesspool of <laughs> the internet, same oh. principle applies. Wow, look at that. And narrow it down. Visit Seeker, a new search engine that lets you search with confidence. Then what? Seeker uses artificial intelligence to evaluate news and information and assigns a Seeker score that scores the quality of news results based on journalistic principles and general reliability. By analyzing content for subjectivity, persuasive techniques, and exaggeration, Seeker works to solve issues that can drastically impact our world, like rapidly spreading misinformation. Only Seeker has a Seeker score that goes from 0 to 10. Lower scores are a big red flag to alert you that the content might be manipulated, unreliable, or inaccurate. Infowars to BBC. That's right. That's it. Acosta. With this... <laughs> <laughs> Acosta. With this... 
set, I'm going to set my seeker score to Acosta. With this smart tool, choice and speaking of smart tools, choice and control are back in your hands. Are you ready to start feeling good about what you see online? Seek for yourself at seeker.com slash crooked. His next book is going to be called Not a Tool. <laughs> that's S E E K R. The Jim Acosta com. story. That's, that's S E E K R dot com slash crooked. Offline is brought to you by Dems. By now, you've probably heard of ESG investing. Sure have. ESG is a hot trend on Wall Street, and it's been in the news a lot recently. Hot right now. Generally speaking, ESG funds are designed to allow you to invest in a group of companies with high environmental, social, and governance ratings. Hence the name ESG. Yes, thank you. The idea is that when you invest in ESG funds, you're investing with your values. But as the New York Times and other major media publications have pointed out, ESG funds are far from perfect because there's not a standard and verifiable way to assign ESG scores or ratings to a company. In fact, if you dig down and look at the companies that are included in many of the top ESG-rated funds, you'll find that they include companies that overwhelmingly support dun, 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 Republican politicians Ooh, and, and PACs, and PACs. Mm. who in turn seek to undermine ESG ideals. Companies like AT&T, Home Depot, Waste Management, Pfizer, and many others. Bad news bears. Well, good news, Tommy. At Dems, that's D-E-M-Z, we believe that measuring a company's political contributions is a better way to ensure that the companies you invest in share your values. That's why the Dems Fund only includes S&P 500, companies that have made over 75% of their political contributions to Democratic politicians and causes. Oh, and by the way, Dems is also fossil fuel free because fossil fuel companies like Exxon and Halliburton are bankrolling the GOP, also destroying the planet, but that's neither here nor there. Both and. Uh, Dems was awarded a maximum five globe sustainability rating by Morningstar. Here we go. They got five globes, people. And, <laughs> and Dems outperformed the S&P 500 index in 2021 by 2.5% net of fees. So win-win. Search for the Dems ticker wherever you invest or visit Dems.fund to learn more. Investing involves risk. Principal loss is possible. Carefully consider the fund's investment objectives, risk factors, charges, and expenses before investing. This and additional information can be found in the fund's prospectus, which may be obtained by visiting Dems.fund. Please read the prospectus carefully before investing. Distributed by SEI Investments Distribution Company. I was going to ask you this because you mentioned earlier about how he is this card-carrying member of the uh, of the Eastern elite establishment. Do you think he is a status trader, or do you think he is just full of shit, or both, and it doesn't <laughs> matter? <laughs> yeah, I think I think we should say both, both, and I mean, I mean, a status trader. You know, <laughs> I'm sure he would want to call himself that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I'm sure he I would mean, say that. Yeah, I mean, it, look, uh, there's a, a way that he comes by these um, opinions honestly, not the televangelism part, but uh, he's a middle class kid from Richmond, Virginia. You know, I went to his dad's funeral with him, which was. Mm, that's bizarre that he invited you, I thought. <laughs> yeah. Just a bizarre you think? part of the whole thing. I thought, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was, you know, I thought it was the ultimate gorilla move to sort of like spring on your siblings, like, oh, and here morning my dad will be a lady from the Atlantic who you've never met. Right, um, yeah. But they were, by the way, this lovely, warm, gregarious Irish Catholic family that was just like, hey, how you doing? They're so used to his shenanigans. They just, oh, yeah. it's just Steve being Steve. But what I was struck by was, I mean, look, he's born in Richmond, right? Sort of seat of the Confederacy. He, you know, he, his dad worked for the phone company for 50 some odd years. His 401k is blown to smithereens in 2008 and he panics and sells off most of it and loses most of his retirement. Um, it, these are the kinds of politics that I would have had if I'd been born in the exact same circumstances. We always think of our politics as being deeply considered intellectual things when in fact they might just be tribal and we were born that way i mean mm -hmm. i probably didn't have a prayer i was going to be who i was going to be based on the family i was born into in the moment of time and you know all these things so how much of a traitor he is i mean then he went off and you know got himself lots of fancy initials after his ba you know um and that was going to skew him in one direction and he worked at he worked in Hollywood and he worked at Goldman. So that was going to continue skewing him in one direction. Um, but of course I think he's full of shit. Yeah. I mean, how, you know, I, I, mean, I it's, think it's, you, it's just if you the, touch him, a whole vat of shit would spew out. Yeah, of course. <laughs> the number of times on the podcast, he just talks about the working class and the working class people of this country. And, you know, he'll say the other day he said something, he said, you know what? This audience is, is sophisticated. You may not be credentialed, like some of these elite, 
but you're sophisticated, which struck me as he, he is he's touching on exactly what these people want to hear. Right. Which is that like we are so put upon and they think they're so smart. And just because we don't have a college degree, they talk down to us and they tell us what to do and they think we're racist and we blah, blah, all this bullshit. <laughs> Did he use the word credentialed? Yeah, credentialed. Well, OK, because what's interesting about that is that he's recruiting from the vocabulary of the Eastern elite by mm -hmm. saying that credentialism. That's Michael Sandel's argument, right, in the book that he wrote a couple of summers ago, that, you know, we are overrun by, you know, a credentialed elite and perhaps we would do better to diversify it a bit. Um, so it's very funny that he's taking like the Harvard professor's Harvard book and using that language. Of course. Well, that's <laughs> what he... Podcast. But that said, like I said, he comes from that world. I mean, you can have a lot of access to those feelings and a lot of sympathy to that. I mean, my grandpas were both union guys. You know, my dad speaks with like a, a Queens Rockaway accent that could like slather a Bialy. I mean, like he's very, you know, I, 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 I have access to all of those right. instincts and feelings and sympathies. I don't think those are inauthentic. The part that I think of him that's like full of shit is the big lie. I was just going to no say. One, yeah, I mean, no one, no one in the Beltway who knows anything about elections. And we saw it on that Thursday night hearing, that spectacular two hours of like perfectly produced television. Um, Barr, Ivanka, nobody believed. I don't think Trump believes that he I, lost. And I actually had a high level person in the Trump administration tell me that Trump didn't believe it. And I almost put it in the piece and then I thought, well, Without a name, it's not interesting. This person wasn't willing to go on the record. When I read that part of your piece, how he is, you know, people say that, that Bannon doesn't believe the big lie, but of course Bannon tells you, I believe it in my heart, and you know, I, I, I absolutely believe it. To the my core of my being. I bet he justifies that in his mind, saying, this is a bigger war we're fighting here, and it's worth it to lie about this, even to, <laughs> to whoever, because this is a bigger war we're fighting, and this is how we get people revved up, and we're, we're, there's a bigger goal here. Um, what, it, what else did you find out about how he how he views January 6th and what he thinks about these hearings? We're talking in, in the middle of these hearings now. You're reminding me that w one of his former colleagues and not a low ranking one said, you know, he's an ends justify the means kind of guy. So, yep. yes, to your point. Yeah. Why not say it? Right. Because if he believes that it's all with a righteous ultimate goal, mm -hmm. you can repeat it. Um, January 6th. You know, uh, it wasn't going to be. He wasn't going to come clean with me, but it was interesting that he spoke about it at all. Um, yeah. And I think part of it is bragging rights. I think he, it, that morning, the Washington Post and New York Times, everybody had come out with the story that Bannon had been on the morning phone call log and the evening phone call log. And then there was this almost eight hour gap in between that was unaccounted for that happened to encompass the window of the insurrection. So um, when I asked him about it, uh, at first he was... Well, he lied. I mean, he said that he was downstairs watching the events unfold in the war room in his podcast studio. Um, the problem with that is that I had spoken to his daughter for a couple of hours and she had been on the mall and had been warned away from the Capitol by Mark Fincham, who's running for Arizona Secretary of State. It's a big election denier. And Mark said, it's chaos up here, don't come near, go back to your father's house. And so she hoofed it, and I think eventually met up with Fincham and went back to um, the Breitbart embassy where they broadcast. And they went to the ground floor, which is where the war room studio is. And all she did was go up the stairs, which I believe is like, you, you can only access it by the outside, poke her head in and say, I'm home and I'm safe. And he was there the entire time, she told me working the phones. Um, well, he told me he was working the phones. She said she didn't see him until close to broadcast time. So you've got the two Bannons giving, and he, he said he was working the phones. He wouldn't tell me who with. I was interested for about five minutes in knowing whether Ginny Thomas was one of them. And he said, no, <laughs> at least there's that. Do no, you, um, at least there's that. Do you get the sense that he wants Trump to run again or is he looking for a new Trump? And like, what's their relationship now? Do they talk at all? Well, so when I started this, I had been told by several people that they hadn't spoken for a year, which was interesting. Hmm. Um, but what does that actually mean? Because they speak to 
enough people in common that they can certainly convey, you know, it can be like sort of the middle school form of communication where you're just kind of conveying your wishes through a third party. But I think that they have recently kind of rapprochet in some weird way because um, he was kind of live broadcasting during a, a, an event at Mar-a-Lago not that long ago. Um, or he was there, you know, via a screen. Um, I think that it suits his aims best to um, play to the Trump base, but to allow for the possibility that somebody else like a DeSantis might eclipse him. And then the idea is to stand for Trumpism and denialism and whatever the MAGA movement is. Um, he's not, he's not going to work at the White House. He's fundamentally a, he's not an employee. He's kind of a lone wolf. He, he can't work for or with anyone. Yeah. You know, well, that's clear. So we've talked about, and you wrote this in the piece, how his plan is to sort of leave a, a smoldering crater where institutions once were. Do you right. think he is competent and disciplined enough to achieve that goal? Is he is he a unique talent on the right, or is is, is his shtick easily replicated by some of the other uh, goobers out there? Well, here's the thing. First of all, I wouldn't call, he's not a goober. That's, I wouldn't <laughs> dare call, I mean, he's smart. Yeah. And and we shouldn't underestimate the kind of sex appeal of being smart for some of his listeners, right? Mm -hmm. that, that it, it, it makes them feel uh, like they're doing something high-minded. Um, and all podcasts are kind of sui generis, right? Or his is. I don't think it's like a podcast out of a box. Right. Bongino and Shapiro are very good. They have much bigger audiences. They don't do what he does. He is a different kind of variety hour with a lot of activists who show up and his own set of suite of correspondents. And um, it, it's just different. And uh, like I said, I think it can be asymmetrically powerful. You can inflame. Its, it, its whole objective is to get people out of their chairs and doing things. And as you said, on the left, there isn't much that does that. And um, on the, even on the far right, um, other than shouting it back at the television or feeling yourself affirmed, his is really the one that provides a roadmap. Yeah, and that's, that's part of the danger, I think. I, I think it's part of the danger. And I think, you know, and for casual listeners, it's worth picking up tips about how to organize. And it's also worth listening to just the content, what he's saying, so that we know just what kinds of, how he's moving the Overton window, what kinds of things he's trying to mainstream into the discourse, which, yes, you're right, Tucker is too. Other people are doing that too. But he's not also giving them phone numbers to call so that they can go do it at the state level or in their backyard. Yeah, right. that's the difference. Uh, the difference. Jennifer Sr., thank you so much for... Um, for writing the piece, spending that much time with Steve Bannon, and, uh, and thank you, thank you, of course, for uh, for joining offline. This has been great. Yeah, it's been really fun. Thanks for having me. Take care.